such a fascinating story because um, in some ways when we think of Athens in antiquity and especially Athens in late antiquity, we have to imagine that this is maybe something like Harvard or Oxford where the ruling class comes in and out of those schools with some regularity. So if you are the Emperor Julian, for example, you studied in Athens under some of these teachers and you know these people. And these people know that they know you and know that they have access to the kinds of things um, that you can provide as a leader in that society. And so this point of access gives them a certain arrogance, sense of they are owed respect that maybe in some ways they're not. So I think that we can, um, if we look now in the United States at say the way that Harvard professors bounce in and out of government and have connections that are formal and informal to the people running the government, we have to imagine that Athenian teachers were in a similar situation. Athens very much was like the, the Cambridge, uh, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts or Oxford of the ancient world. So, Dr. Watts, thank you for joining me. Um, thank you. How are you doing? Great. Great today. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Um, this interview, I'd like to focus on your book, City and School in Antiquity. Um, I know you focus on Alexandria and Athens, um, but for the sake of narrowing our discussion, I would like to uh, discuss the case study of Athens for this period of time. So for my audience, um, those unfamiliar with the concept of Paideia, could you perhaps give a brief summary? Sure. So the uh, the word paideia means just simply education or, or learning. But in antiquity, this becomes a kind of defining structure or defining set of attributes for people who belong to an educated elite. And so it becomes a way to differentiate people of certain backgrounds and particularly people of privileged and uh, educated backgrounds from people who don't possess that same kind of training. And so there are different ways that people um, with pi people who have gone through the educational process and acquired this kind of status of being educated uh, manifest this. So it, it comes through in the way that they dress sometimes, it comes through in the way that they speak, it comes through in the way that they are supposed to behave. Um, and so someone who is trying to display this We'll do things like throw in literary references in the way that we sometimes throw in pop culture references. Um, you know, you can display that you have read a lot of Marvel comics by throwing in references to Molten Man and um, the Prowler, and people will get you. You know, they'll get that that's where you're coming from. The same with right, those, those are the deep cuts, huh? <laughs> <Marvel>. <laughs> right. Which like if you're throwing in um, quotes from Homer into your daily conversations, or you're throwing in kind of jokes from Aristophanes, it shows that you possess a kind of cultural background that marks you as distinctive. And the people who claimed this background also expected it to be recognized and they expected certain privileges that come from it. Um, so for example, if you were educated in late antiquity, you could expect that, for example, a governor would not physically um, violate you. They wouldn't whip you or um, use physical punishment on you because you had a status that indicated that you needed to be treated like a gentleman because you were a gentleman. Um, but then that also went, that also manifested in the way you were supposed to behave. So someone who was educated was not supposed to show anger. They were not supposed to yell and scream. They were not supposed to hit or abuse people. Um, they also were supposed to show a uh, level of uh, maturity, calmness, and I suppose you could say like temperance or prudence in the way that they behaved with other people. And so it was a sort of two-way street where you had this training and you acquired a kind of ticket that got you into the country club set of the Roman Empire. Uh, but in return, you needed to, to mind your manners and behave in a way that was respectful of the privileges that you were you were being given. Um, but the entry to all of this was elite rhetorical and literary education. Fascinating. Um, I wanted to, um, when you were discussing um, what Paideia was, um, something that struck me were two examples that I remember quite clearly from my recent studies. Um, one is uh, Cariton. Cariton's using Homer, he's using 
all these different kinds of uh, allusions to the Iliad, the Odyssey, to Plato. Uh, you know, Achilles Tatius is doing the same thing uh, with Leucope and Clitophon. Um, also, I think the best example for me is uh, one of my favorites, Lucian. Mm -hmm. uh, Lucian, when he's doing a true story, he's he emphasizes that I'm writing for a certain group and I would tell you what all these references mean, but, you know, I expect you to understand what I'm talking about. You know, it's like the, uh, the, the antique version of the Easter egg nowadays. Like you were <laughs> exactly. Saying, so. Yeah. I think that that's, you know, if we wanted to think about this in a modern context, um, one of, I think that's actually a great way to do it, to think about the Easter eggs in Marvel movies where if you are familiar with the canon, you see all of these things um, and you notice all of the, the interactions and what we would call intertexts where, uh, you know, um, a Spider-Man movie will have something that references Doctor Strange, which will have something that references Winter Soldier, which will have something that references Black Widow. And, and if you know all of these things, then you know all of the references and you appreciate all of the levels on which the kind the conversation is proceeding in that particular work of art. And in antiquity, it was a similar thing. Um, you were expected to write in a way where you're embedding these references in whatever it is that you're putting together so that there was added depth and nuance to what you were writing. And, uh, and sometimes you look at some of the, I guess one of my friends calls these literary games, um, where really, really deeply educated people do things like um, recompose the Bible using snippets taken from Homer. Um, or they do things like um, put together prose and meter and Greek and Latin and make it into this, this sort of pastiche that blends Latin authors, Greek authors, famous Latin texts, famous Greek texts, uh, and puts it all together in something that is totally incomprehensible if you don't have the training uh, to appreciate what the author is trying to do. But if you do have that training, there is incredible depth to this because they're taking you on a journey through a thousand years of literature and they're bringing you into and out of different sort of images that authors have developed over that time period. And when you read the work, if you read the work with this educational background to fully understand what they're doing, the wealth of illusion, the wealth of image, the wealth of themes um, expands dramatically. And the work goes from something that looks pretty incomprehensible to somebody who doesn't know any of this to something that is rich and beautiful. And, um, you know, it, it's what Michael Roberts calls the jeweled style, um, where all of these little sort of trinkets are embedded to make the work um, shine in a particularly fascinating and dramatic way. But you have to know what these trinkets are and you have to know where they're coming from and you have to have the training to be able to appreciate exactly what's going on there because the short reference will to you open up a world in that that bigger text that allows you then to appreciate the text that's being composed thank you for that um so the characters in, in your book uh they're, they're very colorful uh we're introduced to a a very uh, interesting cast, to say the least. Um, you have teachers of rhetoric, of philosophy. You have like somebody like um, Herodes, Atticus, uh, Prohiresius, Proclus among them. Um, what? And, and you also emphasize not only um, the eccentricities of these figures and how they blended into social life and how important they were. Um, you also make a point to discuss um, some of the social and economic factors that went into creating uh, the situation where these teachers of rhetoric and philosophy were so prominent in the society at the time. So if you could kind of talk about what were some of the social and economic factors that led to the rise to prominence of the Athenian teachers of rhetoric yeah, and philosophy at the time. Yeah, I think that that's, um, it's such a fascinating story because um, in some ways, when we think of Athens in antiquity and especially Athens in late antiquity, we have to imagine that this is maybe something like Harvard or Oxford, where the ruling class uh, comes in and out of those schools with some regularity. 
So if you are the Emperor Julian, for example, you studied in Athens under some of these teachers and you know these people. And these people know that they know you and know that they have access to the kinds of things um, that you can provide as a leader in that society. And so this point of access um, gives them a certain arrogance uh, and a, a certain sense of um, a certain sense that they are owed respect that maybe in some ways they're not. So I think that we can, um, if we look now in the United States at, say, the way that Harvard professors bounce in and out of government and have connections that are formal and informal to the people running the government, we have to imagine that Athenian teachers were in a similar situation. Athens very much was like the, the Cambridge, uh, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts or Oxford of the ancient world. Um, and it had that status going all the way back. Um, it's a very much by late antiquity an inherited status that goes all the way back to the fifth century BC uh, and Athens as the kind of school of history and the center of um, philosophical and literary life in the Greek world. It's a status that Athens capitalized upon in the Roman period. Um, it gave it a sort of prestige that made students want to go to Athens above all other places because this was the, the prestige destination. And the teachers who had the endowed chairs in Athens were the most prestigious in the entire Roman world. They weren't necessarily the best, um, but they were the people who had the titles that mattered the most. And so sometimes this would create uh, peculiar dynamics and rivalries where Athenian teachers couldn't quite measure up to the achievements of people in other places. Um, we see this in particular in the second century where there are really spectacular rhetoricians working in Asia Minor uh, who are better than the Athenians of that time. Uh, and yet at the same time, you see the Athenians try to sort of lord their cultural capital over these people in Asia Minor uh, and claim that the status of being a teacher in Athens supersedes anything that these other people might have achieved. And therefore you should respect an Athenian teacher, even though in terms of competence and performance, the Athenian teacher perhaps doesn't measure up to someone like Aeolus Aristides who's working across the Aegean in, in Asia Minor. Um, we see something similar actually in the fourth century where Hypatia, a teacher in Alexandria, her student Zynesius comes to Athens and says, this place is terrible. You know, like my, my teacher is so much better than anything that you guys have but he's arguing against a reputation and he sort of acknowledges, I probably won't win this. You know, it's very hard for me to, to take the failings of Athens in the contemporary context and convince people that Alexandria superseded Athens. I'm gonna try, but it's really hard for me to um, argue against the reputational capital that Athens has accumulated. Right, and uh, you, you mentioned other economic factors and, and uh, factors such as uh, the Herulean invasion, um, creating a kind of issue with uh, the other kind of elite agricultural ruling, ruling classes, and they were kind of in a depressed state. And that kind of created a situation where some of these teachers were untouchable. And uh, yeah. Athens seemed to be, yeah, the, Athens is kind of coasting on this um, cultural kind of capital, if you will. It's a uh, you know, there's, it's at the time it's like a uh, cultural koine that Athens is synonymous with this, but it, um, maybe by this time, like you're saying, it's not as prominent as it once was during the time of say in Plato and Aristotle. Um, so um, yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you for that answer. Yeah, I think that if you look at it, the story of Athens in the Roman period is um, a general uh, erosion from a city that was a real city uh, when the Romans first sort of dominated Athens in the second century BC, Athens is a real place. It's a, you know, has a real economy, it does real things. Mm -hmm. um, by the later fourth century AD, it's an educational center, it's a college town. Um, yeah, the like industry the is kind of hollowed out. Um, the ruling classes that are not involved in education really don't do much. Um, and the really um, economic driver of the city has become education and the city has shrunk. Uh, you know, it's probably a 15,000 person city uh, in late antiquity. So it really, really is a college town. Uh, and that means that there is an oversized influence um, by these people who are the only world-class things in Athens anymore. Um, and again, people, everybody knows it. 
Absolutely. Um, so uh, speaking of that uh, cultural koine and, and that reputation Athens has uh, for attracting students. Now, this is very hard for us to imagine uh, in my <laughs> audience, but um, in the fourth, uh, you know, at this time, you know, from the second to the fourth century, uh, Athenian teachers seem to be almost like a, a car, have a cartel going in terms of uh, getting students, uh, like teachers, like you have a really good example in your book, a uh, uh, city and school of prohiresis. You know, he's uh, prohiresis. He's uh, having his uh, hatiroi kidnap students right off the boat. It was like a normal thing. You know, they had this thing going with, you know, people just getting right into town on those boats. And, you know, uh, you know, I just found that bizarre, but also strangely, <laughs> odd you know like human trafficking in all senses seems to have just been rampant in all its shapes and forms in antiquity uh, something we you know all have to deal with when we look at this stuff with a neutral eye but uh, so i don't know if you could kind of explain what who the hatiroi were what role did they play in a teacher's inner circle yeah so um in in antiquity, there were two kind of statuses among teachers, actually maybe three, if you want to sort of chart this the whole way across. But um, but I think if we were to think of this in modern terms, um, teachers had a status as a kind of full professor. That's if you ran the school, you were the full professor. You might have um, assistants who were maybe teaching assistants um, who would do a lot of the teaching under you and were associated with you, but could also leave and set up their own school if they wanted to at a certain point. Then you had a group of students who had been with you a while, who had sworn a formal oath to study under you and they were your students. They associated with you. Um, and if they were asked, they would say that they are you know, part of your circle. These would be maybe graduate students. Um, and then, or maybe even majors, uh, you know, like a history major. And then you had students who just paid to come to classes. Um, and that's the lowest, the lowest ranking group in this, this hierarchy. The uh, hearers, and students, correct. Yeah, the hearers. And that's what they, they paid to hear. Um, and some people would pay to hear multiple teachers. You know, they would pay a kind of base level tuition to hear the lectures at multiple schools. Um, some teachers were public teachers, you know, and they would give public lectures that were open to any students who wanted to come. And so their hearers would maybe not pay them a fee at all. But um, the Hatiroi are people who are, they are sworn to be the devotees of this teacher. Uh, and so they have a much more formal relationship with the teacher than the more casual listeners who come in and, and listen to lectures and maybe occasionally give give declamations and get graded on it. The Hatiroi belong in a circle with this teacher. And so instead of just coming to class and listening, they have special meetings in the teacher's house. They have seminars, they have much more personalized instructions and they pay more. Um, but they are with the school for a much longer period of time. I mean, a casual listener can take a course for a year and leave. Um, many of them are done in three years. Um, and so they are maybe at the level of an undergraduate, maybe at the level of a kind of lower division undergraduate student. Um, but the Hatiroi are really invested in the success of the circle in the way that a listener is not. Uh, and so when we're talking about the um, situation with Poiresius, Proresius had a group of Hatiroi who um, would go and meet the boats that came in to Athens from certain regions. And the stories we're told are that they would uh, effectively kidnap people who came off the boats from certain regions that were, that were their regions. Um, he was from Armenia. And so he got Armenia plus Asia Minor uh, and a couple of other places, Egypt as well. Um, and when people from those regions showed up, his Hatari would come to the port and escort the students to the school. Um, in many cases, those students already intended to study under Proresius. And so this is just like a welcoming group at freshman orientation day. In other cases, though, uh, it doesn't seem like they wanted to. Uh, and so the escorting to the school was a little bit more violent. There was also really extreme hazing that would go on. Um, and so students would be locked away. Uh, they would then have a formal um, 
ritual procession to a bathhouse in Athens where they would be blindfolded and they would be um, threatened and assaulted. Some say gently, some say not gently at all. Uh, and then when they finally agreed to, to join the school, they would then be welcomed as members of the, the scholastic environment. Um, you're right that it looks to us like this was terrible. And I think we have some students who say it was terrible. Um, Libanius, who is a very famous fourth century rhetorician, uh, got hooked up with the teacher, a teacher he didn't want to study with in Athens because of this. Um, but other people were actually apparently totally fine with this. You know, they, they understood it was pageantry. They had already intended to study under Poeresius or whoever it was who abducted them. Um, and so this was a kind of pageantry that, that symbolized their incorporation into a community that they already wanted to join. And so for them, this was, um, I think Gregory Nazianzen says, this is, you know, it's a lot of show, but it's not a lot of danger. Um, and most people understood that. Some people didn't. Um, but, you know, it did create the potential for really serious misunderstandings, uh, but also the fact that this is a, you're swearing to join a community. Um, it means that if you cross the teacher or you cross the teacher's students, you have a problem, you know, because you've gone back on something that you swore to do. You've also gone back on membership in a group that really is supposed to be meaningful to you. It's supposed to be a kind of second family. And if you are not loyal to that second family, you can expect retaliation, sometimes physical, but certainly um, retaliation in the kinds of career prospects you'll have coming out of the school. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, Apuleius and his Apologia talking about, um, you know, the, the penalties for betraying the mystery, you know, cult you're in or whatever. Um, yeah. You know, they're fascinating. These, these We could do a whole show just on the students themselves. <laughs> um, and I'd love to have you back to talk about that sometime. Um, for sure. But uh, for the sake of this video and for time, let us uh, get to one more question. Overall, uh, City and School really emphasizes uh, that this is a period of time when the empire is shifting uh, in terms of uh, culture, in terms of uh, what we would call today religion. Um, and as a result of that and the changes in the um, proclivities of the uh, ruling elites and, and the emperors themselves. Um, what were some of the results of the changes in policy, um, especially good examples like uh, Constance and Julian uh, versus how things had been done before in terms of Paideia and, and education? Yeah, I think one of the big things that we get in the fourth century is a, a realization um, by a people involved in this educational industry that all of a sudden, um, people are attaching religious significance to what they're teaching. Uh, the, the courses, the texts, the exercises, all of the things that had been used traditionally to train people and make them educated Romans, um, there were religious aspects to it, but just simply because those were aspects of how life worked. So one of the exercises that students would do would be to chart their daily routine. And it would include, you know, sacrificing to the gods in the morning and praying and, you know, just doing things that are normal things that, that you do. And all of a sudden in the fourth century, people started saying, well, wait a second. I mean, this is not what Christians are supposed to be doing. Um, and so religious education became something that had a presence in Paideia, even though initially no one actually had thought of it that way. It was just kind of what you did. It was something that everybody did. You know, why wouldn't you think about sacrificing to the gods when everybody did it? Uh, all of a sudden, these traditions, many of which were educational traditions that long predated Jesus, um, all of a sudden, these become things with religious import. And as you get into the middle part of the fourth century, people begin to question whether it's appropriate for them to be there anymore. Uh, and this leads in the early 360s to the Emperor Julian saying, not only should these things be there, but you should take them seriously. You know, this religious content in the educational curriculum isn't something that's just there to teach you how to, to talk pretty. It's there to encourage you to behave in a specific way. And if you don't take it seriously, and you're not going to teach people to take it seriously, you can't teach anymore. Uh, so he issues a law on that basis prohibiting Christians from teaching 
anything from the classical curriculum um, unless they are going to actively advocate for the pagan gods in, you know, in their teaching of that curriculum. Um, and this is a non-starter for many Christians. They see this as a ban on Christians teaching and um, probably Julian, you know, intended it to be a ban on Christians teaching. But this interest, this, um, this insertion of religious uh, protreptic and religious conversion um, into an educational curriculum that had long not really been seen as particularly religious uh, is something that is so toxic that Christians, of course, react to this, but pagans react against it too. Um, because what pagans see is that the empire is changing. There are people who are not, not pagan, um, and they don't want this curriculum to become something that applies only to pagans. And so pagans and Christians both react strongly against this insertion of a kind of religious protreptic uh, into the educational curriculum in a way that forces uh, the empire to go back from where Julian had put it. Um, and the curriculum remains effectively, I suppose, non-denominational, non-sectarian, um, non-confessional, uh, you know, into at least the later fifth and into the sixth century. Um, and so the legacy of Julian is, you know, underlining the possibility that education could become something designed to make people pagans. Um, and once he underlines that possibility, it becomes clear there is no consensus for this. Um, there's not really much support for it. And it, in a way, I think, saves the general relevance of this curriculum for the better part of a century, century and a half. Um, and so what Julian did was in the short term, extremely destructive to his own objectives. And in the long term, I think probably in some ways almost conducive to um, creating a consensus that Paideia really does matter in building a non-denominational um, social class that is joined by a certain pursuit of learning and a certain way of behaving that doesn't have to do with whether they're Christian or pagan. It creates a, a kind of ruling class in the Roman Empire that can survive the religious changes of the fourth century without splintering because they still have a common conversation that both Christians and pagans can participate in. Absolutely. And that's something that you really mention um, and emphasize in the book um, and in your next book, The Final Pagan Generation, which we will touch upon in another interview, um, that uh, at this point, since Paideia is a social glue, if you will, that holds these groups together, elites, whether they're Christian, whether they're pagan, regardless of what they believe, the most important thing is that they adhere to a common code, that they adhere to um, certain values. And, you know, um, I, I just found that fascinating and, and we will touch upon that definitely in another interview. Um, but Dr. Watts, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Uh, where can people find you and your books? Uh, so um, you can find my books on, on Amazon. Uh, and then I have a YouTube channel called The Eternal Decline and Fall of Rome that has some um, longer form discussions and, and uh, material about Roman history from the beginning until really about the sixth century AD. Amazing. Yes, I, I really, I peruse your channel quite often. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for joining me. This has been an honor. Um, take care. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon.